Welcome to another edition of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we keep it real and we bring it to you raw. Been a lot of questions that people have asked me about all kinds of things related to prison. So today we're going to talk about that first day, that first day of going to prison. And I can tell you from experience that I believe everybody's first day going to prison is different. Why is it different? How is it different? I'm going to tell you how it's different. Some guys go into prison with a couple of years, a year or two, three, four, five years. Some guys go in with 20 years. Guys like myself go in and go in with a 40-year sentence. And other guys go in with life. And I think when you're going in with different sentences, your approach is different. Your feelings are different. Most guys that are serving a little bit of time go to a prison that I don't want to use the word nice, but a little more kinder. There's a little more kindness at these lower security prisons where dudes aren't running around with life sentences. You know, dudes ain't running around killing people, usually at a camp or a low. But when you go to a prison like the prison that I went to, Big Sandy, with a 40-year sentence, things are different. And I remember that morning waking up and heading to prison that morning. I was in Youngstown, Ohio at a private prison holding facility. That was one of the most dirtiest places I've ever seen since I've been in prison roaches and rats and the food was absolutely horrible, almost to the point where you couldn't eat it. Now, I remember the cop knocking on my door at about three in the morning. I heard that knock. At first, I wanted to pretend that I didn't hear him because there was a part of me inside that was nervous, perhaps even scared, scared of what laid before me, or what I was about to face. And then I heard the second knock. And I knew there was no way of getting around that the cop was at my door getting ready to tell me that I was going to prison. So I yelled out, what's up? He says, Mark's pack it up, you're leaving. I knew that that was the moment. That was the moment that my reality was here, that I was heading to prison. And I was heading to a dangerous prison. I wasn't heading to one of those low security prisons. I wasn't heading to a camp. Wasn't heading to an FCI, although I was hoping I was, medium security. Nope. The cards wouldn't play out like that for me. Instead, I was headed to USP Big Sandy. I pulled myself from under the covers, and I looked in that mirror. And when I looked in that mirror, I asked myself a question. And I mean this. I literally asked myself, Chad, are you going to be okay? And I looked in that mirror... I didn't know if I was going to be okay. All I knew was I was going to a dangerous prison with a 40-year prison sentence. I could give up, not care, go in there and go balls to the wall and whatever happens, happens. Or I could walk in there and try to conduct myself like a man and figure out a way through the law library how to get out of prison. Ended up going down to the R&D department in Youngstown, Ohio at that CCA place and had to do what every man that's ever been to prison had to do. I had to get butt naked in front of a bunch of other men. I was told to open my mouth, bend over, spread my ass cheeks. It made me mad enough to pluck a chicken. And I mean that literally. Because you're belittled. Having to get naked in front of other men while they inspect you, inspect your balls and your ass. Who wants to experience that? That's the first part about prison that you don't want to experience. That's the first part that should make you say, man, never again. Ended up getting on a bus and we drove from Youngstown, Ohio to Pennsylvania. And we got on this airplane, this Conair airplane. And when we got on that plane, there was hundreds of men and women standing out there being transported on buses and planes and all going to different destinations. O'Connor. I ended up going to Atlanta, the infamous Atlanta prison that was taken over when I told that story about Silverstein. We get to Atlanta and 
This is the place where you can only distinguish guard from prisoner by the clothing that they wear. And they talk to you nasty. So you get on the fucking wall. They pat you down and they give you a bag lunch with a bologna sandwich and a cheese sandwich and apple and a sugar-free Kool-Aid pack. By now, my stomach was touching my back. Yeah, literally, I was starving. Get in the cell, I eat the sandwich, and I have a celly that started telling me about his prison experience in Atwater and how he had to check in over a drug debt. And at the time, I didn't know prison politics. At the time, I didn't really understand the world that I was walking into. But this dude, he was a check-in, and I actually lived with him for about two days. And I was just thankful to get out of the cell with this dude, and I get on a bus. And this time, I'm handcuffed with a black box on my cuffs. And anybody that knows about that black box, you know you can't move your hands. You're shackled. You can't move your wrist. And for real, it hurts. It hurts a little bit. Not only does it hurt your wrist, but it hurts your pride. It makes you angry. It makes you sad. It makes you wonder why they're doing this to you and all these other people on the bus don't have these black boxes. It's only a few of us, four or five of us. We get on that bus and we start heading to that world that no one wants to head to. We get to Big Sandy, we pull in the driveway, see that gate open, cops are talking. We get off the bus. When we get off the bus, we get an interview with the SIS and the captain. And this is where it gets crazy, folks. I go into this room and I'm interviewed by an SIS officer, a captain, I believe a lieutenant. And he asked me what I was in prison for and I tell him and I hear the other guy whistle. I think it was the captain that whistled or the lieutenant. And he says, they gave this cracker 40 years. And he asked me, what did I get 40 years for? And I explained to him, and it sounds crazy when I explain it to him. I tell him I got five years for a 12 gauge shotgun, 25 years for a 22 rifle, yeah, the feds give out that kind of time for a 22 rifle and a 12-gauge shotgun. And I got 10 years for the crack. All together, it's 40 years. I remember him whistling, and he kind of knew about this whole 924C stack, and he told me, yeah, they're probably going to change that. That was many, many years ago. And eventually, they did change it, but it took years upon years for them to change that. And that's how I ended up getting out of prison. Actually, today is the anniversary of my release or the anniversary of when the judge granted my compassionate release motion to release me, to allow me, go back, allow me to go back into society. But anyway, back to that first day in prison. So they tell me not to get tattoos on my face, conduct myself like a man, stick with my own people, and make sure I get a knife. What? Make sure I get a knife. I already had heard the stories about Big Sandy, about people stabbing people and people getting killed. But never in my wildest dreams would I ever think that the cop would tell me, especially a person in a high position in security, to get a knife. He told me to make sure I got a knife. I left that room thinking to myself, what the hell are they stabbing people for? Why are they killing people in this prison? I make it back to that R&D cell and a bunch of dudes are in there. Hey, man, what they say? And I kind of tell them what everything that went on and what the cop said to me. There was another dude that went right after me named Shamrock. He was on the bus with us. He was just a little skinny dude from the Midwest, a bunch of tattoos. But the whole bus ride, he talked like he was the toughest dude in the Bureau of Prisons. He had me convinced. About an hour in of his stories, I started to think, this dude was full of shit. Sure enough, he was full of shit. He goes in with the SIS captain and lieutenant, and he comes back. And they don't put him in the cell with any of us anymore. He says, oh, man, they're locking me up. They put him in his own cell. But I had heard the captain tell the officer at R&D to wreck him alone and house him alone that he was checking in. Tough-ass Shamrock had checked in, but he had checked in for a reason. He checked in because he was part of a skinhead gang in prison, and he ended up running and not helping his brothers when they were attacked. So he knew he couldn't come on a compound at Big Sandy because his people walked there. And as soon as he came out, they would have definitely got at him. They would have destroyed this kid. So his recourse was to go to protective custody. So anyway, we ended up going into the prison my first day. Get my bedroll, carrying that on my shoulder. 
big old mattress, the bed roll, and I'm walking down the hallway, and I hear the deuces get hit. Some people say, what are the deuces? Well, the deuces are the alarm. Back in the day before the cops had walkie-talkies, they would hit the two on their phone, 22. That would send an alarm off to all the other cops to respond to help this person. Well, now they got walkie-talkies, and I hear the deuces go off. I hear that beeping sound. Beep, 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 beep. And I hear them talking about something on the wreck yard, a knife fight or some type of assault. They put us on the wall, stand there for about five, ten minutes. They turn us back around, and I see three or four white dudes walking down the hallway. And I see another dude walking down the hallway all beat up, handcuffed behind his back. The white dudes had attacked another white dude on the compound because he was a booty bandit. He was a guy that was trying to manipulate a younger dude into doing some sex shit. And for those of you that have been in maximum security federal prisons, you know that amongst our car, amongst the white dudes, we don't go for that. You can't do that. Doing things like that could cost you your life. It's a yard violation that comes with a serious assault. You try to manipulate or have sex with another white dude or rape someone, your ass is out of here. The white dudes are going to send you. At least back then, that's how it was. We weren't letting you check in, none of that shit. You're going up top, and you're going to be assaulted when you go. Ended up getting to my unit, and this is when I felt it inside. I felt the desperation, the loneliness, the fear, the anger, all at once. And that door opens. When the door opens, I smell instantly cigarette smoke in the air. The lights were kind of piercing. Walk in, the cop questions me and another dude that were at the door, a kid named Kelly out of Missouri. He starts asking me uh, questions about where do I want to live and things like that. And a bunch of white dudes come up. They pull me off to the side away from the cop. And they ask me who I run with. And questions are, do you run with the white dudes? Are you in a gang? These are all the questions that I get. And I had already heard all this stuff in pre-trial, like, you know, what's going on? You got to run with these people. You got to do this. You got to do that. So I answer their questions and tell them, no, man, I run with the whites. Best decision at that time. I'm in a maximum security federal prison. And they tell me that the cell that I'm assigned to is with a white dude who actually turned out to be from my city. And they tell me that dude runs with the blacks, man. If you run with the whites, you can't live with him. So I'm listening to what they say. They're dictating the conversation. They tell the cop that they're going to tell the cop in about 10, 15 minutes where I'm going to live. They outline where I'm going to live. They give me two choices. You're going to live with this old man, Mr. Young. And I talk about Mr. Young in the book. So if you ever read the book, you know who Mr. Young is. If you haven't read the book, you should. You should find out who Mr. Young is. So I ended up choosing Mr. Young instead of another dude that was an Aryan militia type dude who had earlier almost created a race riot at the prison. So I figured my best choice was to go in that cell with Mr. Young. Mr. Young tells me that he sleeps early, he gets up early, he doesn't like to be bothered. I listened to this whole spiel. <laughs> it didn't turn out like that. That night, Mr. Young talked my ear off. That was my first night in prison, Mr. Young talking my ear off. I ended up getting a message that my homeboys wanted to see me the next day. And I'm like, who are my homeboys? Well, my homeboys turned out to be the dudes from New York and Boston. So I ended up going to see my homeboys the next day. They outlined things to me, tell me I got to have my paperwork in 30 days. Asked me if I ever ratted on anybody. You know, all them basic questions. You ever rape kids? They do all that stuff. They ask you all those questions, tell you you got 30 days to get your paperwork. If you don't have your paperwork in 30 days, you got to go up top. You got to go to the hole until you get your paperwork. They find out you're fucked up, that you ratted, that you're a snitch, that you're a sex offender. They're going to smash you. And what I mean by smash is, again, you're not leaving the yard in a good way. You're leaving that yard beat up, stabbed, or killed. And in Big Sandy, I promise you, they were killing people. They were definitely stabbing you. Stabbing you was like an everyday occurrence there. So my first day in prison, meet all the homeboys, get all the questions, how much time I'm doing. And one of my homeboys, one of the shot callers, Adam. Big Adam. Adam's from New York, from the Bronx. Kind of tries to pull me under his wing and tell me about prison and tells me, you know, hey, look, you know, there might come a time when you got to put in work. 
he explains putting in work is when someone comes there that has to be taken care of that, you know, I got to go out there and take care of it. I might have to stab a dude. I might have to beat a dude up, you know, with other dudes. And the rules are we never lose. So he sent three or four people. These are the things that he tells me. He says, but when you're new, you know, everybody puts in work when you first come to the prison. So I'm listening to that and trying to act like a tough guy, like, yeah, man, I'm with it. But deep in my heart, I'm like, damn, I got an appeal. I'm trying to get the hell out of prison. This dude's talking about killing people. And I'm thinking, man, I ain't killing nobody for no one unless I absolutely have to to save my own life. And I start talking to Adam about my appeal. And he laughed at me. Adam laughed at me. He said, look, bro, he said, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, man. He said, but man, this is your life now, Chad. You got 40 years, man. Hardly anybody wins an appeal. And in my mind, I was new to the law. I had done a little legal research in the county jails and all that, but I didn't see the reality that most people don't win appeals. In my heart, I was going to win my appeal and I was going to get out of jail. And I didn't want to jeopardize that. And Adam had broke my hope. Told me, look, man, this is your life. This is the life that you're about to live, man. And you better live it. Live it to the best of your ability. And I would see Adam, you know, the way that he interacted in the weeks to come, the days to come, the months to come. And he, he lived the life like he didn't care, man. Adam just didn't care. He got drunk, used drugs. He was a tough dude. A lot of people feared Adam. I became his celly. And eventually Adam had stabbed the CO at Big Sandy. Stabbed the shit out of him. He ended up with another 25 years on top of, you know, the sentence that he was already serving. He already had, I believe, a 10-year sentence in the feds and a 20-year sentence in the state for a murder. And now he was going to serve that 10-year sentence in the feds and a 25-year sentence in the feds before he ever got a chance to go serve the 25-year sentence in New York State for the murder. I watched Adam destroy his life in prison. But that's beyond the first day. We're going to talk about that in another video. About Adam stabbing that cop and what happened. And we'll talk about Ace and how Ace was shot from the gun tower and killed. We're going to get into all that stuff. Because I want people to see what's really going on in prison, man. I want kids to see that the cops will shoot you. That there's dudes in there that will kill you. That there's dudes in there that will kill the cops. All that shit, man. That stuff happens. Like I always say, I don't know you, but I care about you. I care about you enough to sit in here and tell you what's really going on. I care about you enough to not sugarcoat prison, to not glamorize it and make you think that it's cool to go to prison because there ain't nothing cool about going to bed hungry at night. There ain't nothing cool about getting stabbed in prison. There ain't nothing cool about thinking you're never going to get out. There ain't nothing cool about never seeing your family again or ever touching a woman again, or ever kissing her again. Ain't nothing cool about that, man. This shit is real, man. That first day in prison was a day like you'll never experience ever in your life. You will never see a first day in prison unless you walk into prison. Unless you walk behind those gates and you hear them slam, and you think to yourself, this could be the last thing that I ever hear. This could be my life. When that prison door slams, this is your life. And it's crazy. When you drive into a prison, they got this sliding door. And it just slides. Mm, boom. And the bus drives in. And that's the last time you might see a car. That might be the last time you see a tree. Because that door slams again. Mm, boom. Boom. And when it slams, that's your fate. Your first day in prison might be a scary day. But I'm going to tell you this. People in the street, and I say this from experience, the 18 years that I spent in federal prison, I experienced the same thing every day. People in the street have different experiences. But your experience in prison will be the same every day. You will wake up at 5.30 in the morning in a maximum security prison. You will get up. There is no sleeping in. You will put your boots on. You will be ready to live and ready to die. That's what happens in federal prison. And you're going to go to breakfast every day at the same time. You're going to come back from breakfast, and you're going to go to the job that they give you. 
where you're making 10 cents an hour, five cents an hour. And you're going to go to lunch from your job at 12 o'clock and you're going to come back to your job. Then you're going to go back to your unit at three o'clock. Then you're going to stand up at four o'clock for the four o'clock count. Or when they call four o'clock count, depending on what prison you're at, you're going to tell the cop to go fuck off. And you're going to lay in your bed. You're not going to stand up. Most of the time, they won't write you up. Sometimes they will. You're going to get your shot. Lose your little privileges that you got that really don't mean shit anyway. And then you're going to come out at 4 o'clock and go out and kick it with the homeboys, listen to the prison politics, go out to the yard, walk the track, and dream about freedom. Dream about what it was like when you were a young man. 15 years in, you're going to be an old man, possibly. Dreaming that you were still a young man. You're going to be circling that track and telling war stories. You're going to be circling that track and do, be doing what I was doing. <laughs> 15 years later, I still thought I was in 2002. Still thought I was out there in 2001. <laughs> Things had changed drastically, but not in my mind. And that's the point. People in prison grow up physically. But most never grow up mentally. Sometimes you're stuck at that age. The age that you went to prison, I was 24. When I walked out of prison, I was 41. And I still thought I was 24. Yeah, I still lifted weights the same. I could still bench 315, 350. That don't make me a tough guy. I could still play basketball the same way. Still run the same way. But man, the world had changed. I couldn't operate a cell phone. Couldn't operate anything other than an email because that's all I knew from prison was how to operate an email. I still thought I was 24, man. And all the chicks my age didn't look like they were 24 no more. Now they look like they were 41, 42. Some look like they were 50 or 60. I came home to see some of my friends that I was getting money with. Became crackheads, man. Became drug addicts. Some of them had done bids, two or three bids during the whole time that I had done. I came home and some of them dudes were broke. They were still doing the same shit. They were doing when I left, and they still didn't have nothing, man. You want to be that guy? You don't have to be. You can change your life. It all comes from you, man. What do you want to do? What do you want your life to be? Are you going to make the irrational, irresponsible choices that result in you losing your freedom for the rest of your life for 5, 10, 15, 20 years? One day in prison is too long, man. One day in prison is way too long. Imagine what 10 years is like, 15 or 20. Bring it to you real. Bring it to you raw. Blow it on the razor wire TV. And with that, I'm out.